All right. Um, we are going to move right along, and I will introduce myself first since uh, I don't have a name tag. <laughs> but my name is Amanda Lee. I am a senior research manager here at JPL North America. Um, and kind of this panel really focuses on one of the projects that came out of the Bay Area Evaluation Incubator, which was envisioned, as all things take a while here, um, over three years ago. Uh, where is Rohit? Not in the room, but that's okay. Uh, with Rohit, who, who was at JPL uh, prior. And, um, you know, the, the goal here was really to expand the base of rigorous evidence on strategies to reduce and prevent homelessness. Oh, there's Rohit. Thank you. Um, but also um, with kind of because of the funder and because of a relationship to also do this and to evaluate the effect of cash transfers. So JPAL has done a lot of work, you know, historically in looking, looking for partners to generate evidence, but this for us was kind of a new, new endeavor to focus both uh, on a particular geographic area, so to focus in the Bay Area, and also to focus on one particular intervention, which was cash transfers, and then third, also the effect of cash transfers, working with organizations looking to, you know, affect, affect homelessness. Um, our funder at Google.org was unfortunately unable to be here today, but he did share that, you know, their kind of motivation for embarking on this work was um, when talking about systems change, it's really important that we think about innovation, evaluation, and narrative shifting. Um, this project directly includes each of those strategies, which is why we are so excited to be supporting this effort. And then by bringing together unique partners who are deep experts in their respective fields, we can collectively push for new models uh, of support for our community members experiencing <laughs> housing insecurity. Um, and I will save you all a lot of detailed background, but I will just... I'm so excited to share that kind of over the past two and a half to three years, we've gone simply from an idea and a commitment to make this work to having supported initially six organizations and kind of going through uh, learning about evidence, learning about randomized evaluations to funding and launching four randomized evaluations. Um, and this is one of our wonderful project teams from the other side, Bay Area Thriving Families, who I have had the pleasure of working with over the past couple years. Um, so I'm very excited to introduce uh, Dr. Ingrid Ellen, our principal investigator, um, uh, Rahina Vera, uh, an impact analyst from Compass Family <laughs> Solutions, and Chris Constantine, director of data and valuation from Hamilton Families, and I will let them all introduce themselves briefly. I can start, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, Thanks for sticking with us. I know it's, it's a long day today. Um, I'm Chris Constantine, the Director of Data and Evaluation at Hamilton Families. And Hamilton Families is a San Francisco-based nonprofit serving uh, families experiencing homelessness with uh, shelter. Uh, we run the largest family shelter in San Francisco. Um, we have a transitional housing program and a suite of uh, housing services, including um, eviction prevention, um, move-in assistance, you know, security deposit, things like that, um, housing navigation, supporting families in, in finding and securing uh, units. Uh, we have a real estate team that partners with landlords, local landlords, and uh, works with them to accept our, our program, and a longer-term rental subsidy program. So we pay a portion of um, families rent for up to two or three years while they stabilize in, in their community. Um, and my team, uh, the data team, oversees uh, data collection and really the, the usage of data to um, learn uh, for decision making, for reporting and fundraising, but also uh, new initiatives and, and research and evaluation projects like this one. Um, so, really, really lucky to be a part of this. So, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Regina Vera, and I'm the impact analyst for Compass Family Services. Uh, similarly as Hamilton, we are an organization uh, serving homeless families in San Francisco. And we also offer um, a lot of services, and we have several programs, uh, including a city access point where families can go report, um, 
and evaluate the state in which they are um, in re at respect to homelessness. Um, we also have behavioral services um, like therapy where families can like um, go and receive help from professionals. Um, we help families find childcare. Also, um, we have many other services, sorry. Um, but they also include uh, rapid rehousing and we recently opened um, this um, permanent super supportive housing center. Um, and I'm part of the impact and learning team. Um, it, we are um, the part of the organization that coordinates organization-wide um, evaluations for all of our programs and we help um, the staff and members of our organization to be able to um, bring data and um, the evaluation to our programs and be able to act upon that uh, with all the things that we have learned and meet our goals in that way. Great. Um, and I'm Ingrid Ellen, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, thank you to JPEL. This is just, I feel like I've learned so much over the last um, 24 hours or so. Um, and I am on the faculty at NYU, the, the Wagner School at NYU, which is our graduate school of public service. Um, I also am a faculty director at the NYU Furman Center, which is a research center on housing, land use, urban policy that spans across the Wagner School and the law school. Um, and, um, and we've traditionally, we've sort of historically worked a lot with, with New York City, um, the, New York, the local government in New York City, but more recently, um, we were, the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation gave us a generous grant to actually launch a housing lab, which is working with cities now, local officials across the country to help them design and implement and evaluate um, equitable local housing strategies. So, um, and, and in many ways, this, this project is, is uh, you know, I think we consider it as sort of under, under the housing lab. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, so this question is uh, both for Regina and Chris. Um, so prior to this, this study, and you both mentioned kind of both of your organizations have a large kind of suite of services. Um, cash transfers were not kind of part of those set of services. So what made you interested in adding cash transfers to your programs and then being able to, at the same time, rigorous, rigorously evaluate them? I could start, yeah. Um, yeah, this, this is very new for us, um, but we have been doing this work for a long time. Hamilton Families has been around for 38 years. We've been operating our rental subsidy and our housing services since around 2008, so we've learned a lot over that period. And one of the main things that we've learned that we've seen consistently over the years is that uh, families just need more money. And on average, families coming into the program only, they come in with only about $1,500 a month income. Um, as you can imagine, that's not very much. Anyone familiar with the San Francisco Bay Area and the housing market, that, that's really not, not a lot of money. So families just need more money in their pockets because they're, at the end of the month, you know, making trade-offs with, with their bills and things, you know, do I pay for food or do I pay my electricity bill? So we've, we've we identified that that was an issue years ago and continues to get worse. And so we just, we really wanted to put more money in the pockets of, of the people that we work with. Um, the other thing is uh, the length of our services. Um, our rental subsidy due to our contracts and our funders, um, they, they only last about two or three years. So we, we really, you know, want, want families to have a longer period of support. So we see the cash transfers as kind of being that bridge between our rental subsidy and exit and, and housing stabilization. So. Um, so from our side, we've been very excited about all this research that, well, we've been mentioning a lot of uh, today and yesterday um, around cash transfers and how like wonderful all the results have been. Um, but we've also had a lot of a personal organization experience uh, where we have seen what cash transfers can do to families. Um, this, inside of our organization, we have this uh, fund that is called the Stability Fund, where we give uh, one time expense money for families to be able to cover emergency needs or something 
that might be getting on the way of passing a barrier to be able to be, become stably housed. And uh, when we look at what this does for the families and the results and all the um, impact that it has had in their lives, we just are amazed by these wonderful results. Um, additionally, not so long ago, we um, did this small pilot program where we um, gave cash transfers as well um, to families that are part of our child services. Um, and we saw, even though our program was like smaller in comparison to what we're going, to, um, what we're just starting to do, we saw wonderful results in the families that they received the cash transfers, starting with as simple as they open a bank account and now are banked and are able to access all these services that maybe they did not have access before. Um, but realistically, the, the main reason why we were so interested in starting this is um, because there's not enough resources, even though it might seem that it's uh, an emergency need in the San Francisco Bay Area for permanent supportive housing. And um, there is a lot of resources that have been allocated for rapid rehousing. Um, but as Chris was saying, um, with these type of programs, families have to pretty much hit the, the ground running. And we believe that being able to implement a program like this will allow them to become more stable because they will get like a soft landing. I missed the, the second part of your, your question, but I do have a point around uh, why we're interested in rigorously evaluating it. And that, that's really because we wanna, we believe that this, this will help families, that we, we believe that this will increase um, the likelihood that families will stabilize after our programs. And so we really wanna see this done at a larger scale, at, at the city level, state level, you know, nationwide. Um, and we obviously don't have the capacity or the resources to do so, so we, want to really you know, have the rigorous evaluation and the science showing that this, this, this works, so then we can use that to advocate for uh, more funding, more capacity, and things done uh, at a larger scale. Fantastic, thank you. And Ingrid, a, a similar question to you, um, you know, obviously at the, at the Furman Center, and this fits well within your, your housing policy sector, um, but at the same time, I think, Cash transfers are something a little bit new to you, and I will admit, Jay Powell definitely called you out of the blue. Um, yeah. So just, you know, <laughs> what made this attractive to you, and, and why was this an, an interesting question to pursue and an interesting and worthwhile uh, brisk to, to, yeah. to embark on? Um, well, I have so many answers to that question. I mean, really, there's so many ways in which I was excited about this project. I mean, I, I'll just state the obvious, which is that you know, homelessness is a persistent and critical problem in, in the U.S. and, and around the world. Um, and we actually have surprisingly little rigorous evidence about, about what works to, um, to reduce homelessness. I mean, it's funny because I was listening to these other panels about, you know, the, the health policy people saying there's not enough of an RCT culture and the education policy people saying there's not enough of a, like, a culture around research and, and, and RCTs. And like in housing, there's like no, I mean, I can count them on one hand. Okay, now I need two hands because of JPAL's work, which is great. But really, there is very little. So this was just, and, and I, I will be honest also, I mean, I have not. I, my research has been quasi-experimental and you know, used observational big administrative data sets. So you know, it was also an opportunity for me personally. But and, and I wanna be clear though that there is a, I mean, there is strong evidence that if you provide homeless families with um, families experiencing homelessness with housing choice vouchers, that that will significantly reduce their risk of, of returning to homelessness. And housing choice vouchers, I think probably most of you know, but basically it's, it's the largest rental housing assistance program in the United States. Households basically pay 30% of their income on rent and they can rent an apartment on the, on the private sector. And then the government pays the balance of the rent up to a up to a local payment standard, um, and and there's a, you know HUD HUD ran a um, an RCT one of the five on my hand right that that showed that um, that providing housing vouchers to families experiencing homelessness did really reduce significantly reduce their risk of returning to homelessness, um, but but there are issues with scale.
scaling that solution of vouchers. And I'm a huge fan of vouchers, let me be clear, but, but right, one is political, right? That, um, you know, the right now in, in the United States, sort of one in four, maybe one in five eligible families receive housing choice vouchers, right? Um, and, uh, and they're just, um, you know, to, to scale it up, I mean, it, granted, all, I think most of the Democratic candidates for president in, in, um, in 2020 did advocate for making housing vouchers an entitlement, but, you know, we just, we haven't seen that movement. Um, it probably would cost about $100 billion. I'm not saying, like, never say never, but it would be um, an uphill battle. To, so... Um, so it'd be expensive. There, there's also a question of whether, you know, what a, what a housing voucher provides is essentially a potentially kind of permanent, long-term, very generous subsidy. And it may be that for some families, they could actually get back on their feet with, um, with less support, right? With less money. I mean, vouchers are, are expensive. Um, um, and, you know, and then beyond that, there are also, you know, programmatic challenges to potentially scaling up the voucher program. I've been doing actually a lot of work lately on voucher lease up rates, and we're showing that it's increasingly difficult for, for families to use their vouchers and to find homes and successfully lease them and get landlords to agree to participate. Um, and and uh, so there's growing interest in sort of finding ways to simplify the voucher program. I mean, one of the issues, there's sort of a double take-up problem that not only renters have to, households have to take it up, but landlords do too. And so there's growing interest, including from HUD, in actually kind of cutting out the landlords and providing the assistance directly to, 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 uh, to renters and, and, and to sort of empower them to decide where they, where they want to rent and, and, and also sparing landlords the hassles of what they, what they report as the hassles, let me say, of, of dealing with, with local housing agencies. Um, and so I think, so there, so I think there's sort of, a, it's, it's very timely right now also to think about and think about sort of ways to kind of come up with a simplified, um, you know, we've talked a lot about, a, you know, administrative burden, um, um, a simplified way of providing support. And, and I will just say also, just finally, it's sort of, I think it's also, I don't think that there is evidence yet. I mean. Um, Chris and Raheen, I mean, you, you both operate um, fantastic rapid rehousing programs which provide sort of critical but, but short-term two to three year mm -hmm. sort of assistance. And those, the research on those programs suggests that, um, you know, for, for many families, that's enough to get them back on their feet. But for some families, they sort of hit this cliff of they have this generous <laughs> subsidy and then they have nothing. And so exactly. the idea is that to, to try to see whether providing, um, you know, what, what we are testing as providing cash assistance, $1,000 a month for a year, can provide kind of a softer landing and, and hopefully um, enable more families to find their way to, to stable, long-term, affordable housing. So that's, that's a hope. So I think there's, there's just a huge amount of potential, and, um, and I'm excited to be a part of it. Fantastic. Um, one more question, I think, on kind of the the motivation for doing this and, and the ability to do this. I think almost every panel and talk and speaker we've heard from today has highlighted kind of the challenges of doing research, the challenges of doing RCTs, um, how long this takes. Chris, you talked a little bit about this this before. Um, and Chris and Rahina, you know, kind of given your, your titles here, Director of Data and Evaluation and Impact Analyst, there's, there's obviously a lot of, I think, already a, a culture of evidence within your own organizations. But, um, you know, given that, you know, what was the hope in pursuing an RCT? You know, an, an RCT is, is also different and might, may take longer, may take a lot of money in this, you know, this particular evaluation and design is, is very expensive. Um, so kind of what was your hope in going into this? Are there any long-term gains you're hoping to, to get out of this, this endeavor? I think for for Hamilton families, we or I guess this is this is really my uh, my uh, I aspire to for us to really become uh, a thought leader and share you know kind of pilots uh, new interventions learn uh, and share our learnings with the larger community. Um, so this was an opportunity for us to um, 
do an RCT for the first time, really build that internal capacity for uh, evaluation and you know learn and then be able to, to do more down the road. We've done a couple of smaller scale uh, evaluation projects in the past. Um, we did one a couple of years ago with the Urban Institute out of DC, um, but never, never on this scale and we've never um, done an RCT before. So um, it was, it's really, I think, the most exciting thing is just building our internal capacity for sure. And from our side, I think like the most exciting thing for this to, would be to just try to work and to know that we are, will be able to advocate for families mm -hmm. to be able to receive this assistance and maybe, um, as you mentioned, like um, a lot of families are able to exit rapid rehousing successfully, but for the ones that are not like giving them these um, soft landing and ensuring this opportunity for them. Um, as a team, we do a lot of organization evaluations, but they are mostly internals and they are focused on um, being able to um, continue with our models and make sure that we're um, um, accomplishing our goals um, within our programs. Um, and we had previously had this experience with a, a small um, pilot and we could say it was a randomized controlled trial but we were in the 45 numbers like just 45 people so we're truly excited to be able to see how this will work um, if we start scaling it up and uh, to be able to continue doing this type of research as an evaluation so hopefully this will be the first of many RCTs or like big e evaluation projects that will start being part of. Wonderful, fantastic. Um, one of the other, you know, kind of goals for this panel is we really wanted to highlight, you know, what is it like to do research? What are all of the steps that, that have to happen and kind of what, what has happened over the past two and a half to three years? And, and both what are the challenges, but what are the highlights of working kind of cross-collaboratively? Cross um, you all are, you know, working across two implementing organizations, so you're not just implementing yourself, but you have that extra, extra you know, collaboration with, with another entity. Um, we have the research team. JPAL was involved there in the while, for a while at the beginning. Um, but just what has, this, what has this experience been like? Um, what have you learned about the research process? And I'll stop there, I have more questions. But you know, what has it been like? What have you learned? And um, just what does it entail? We have had a lot of challenges. Uh, as we've gotten into the planning, we're still well, finalizing the first stages, not first stages, but the final stages of the planning. And we know that even though we're starting to enroll people and we're getting into um, like launching our program, there's still a lot of things that we're gonna have to revise. And I feel something like um, that has been really stuck to me is not like the bigger things but the small details and how much time those things consume and how much effort. Um, but I'm really grateful for all the collaboration that we have been able to have across the organizations and also with um, NYU and with j -Pool. Um We've learned a lot coming from everyone's different perspectives and um, I think that's something that was also um, very great experiences to be able to see how we all might come with like pre like assumptions about like how these things have to be done and how um, like what's the best thing for our families because at the end we're all just looking for the best for our families uh, but we all come from different places right and different experiences and uh, I have these like one um, moment that I remember a lot and I bring a lot in conversations with friends or family um, and it's when um, like we started working on our survey for being able to collect data and I at least I thought that this was going to be a more like simple stage of the process but once we got into it uh, even though it seemed that we all kind of agree where we were going with this uh, survey we stopped for a second and we were like okay let's like bring another voice to the table and let's do a cognitive interview and bring uh, actual clients to see what they think about it. 
and uh, we conducted a couple of cognitive interviews, and the first one was great, but when we got to the second one, um, it turned out that the questions actually trigger our participant because she was in a very, um, in a not very positive moment of her life. She had just lost her employment and a couple of events that have trickled down. So um, being able to, as a team, stop, look back, and all like cooperate back and see like what's the best thing to do coming from this event uh, was incredible to be able to cooperate, not just, um, yeah, I think that was a great experience, for example. Yeah, I, I, definitely positives, definitely challenges. Um, <clears throat> the main positive being I feel like we tripled our capacity. Um, you know, data teams and evaluation teams at nonprofits are, are historically just very underfunded, if funded at all. So, um, you know, I started as a team of one. I was a team of one for several years. So uh, now I have a team of five, which is amazing. Um, but I feel like we have the shared knowledge. We're coming together regularly, learning from each other. So that, that has just been amazing. But um, I think coming into this project, um, the, th the things that I thought were going to be really difficult ended up being easier. You know, things like fundraising. Like this is a... Mm -hmm requires a lot of money, um, getting getting stakeholders on board, those are the things that I was worried about going into it. And those ended up being pretty easy compared to all of the operational and logistical things like the sur aligning on a survey and the survey questions and uh, documents and um, how the payments are gonna be dispersed. Like all of the day-to-day the -day little things um, are, I feel like, were the most challenging um, to get through and took the most time. Um, but overall, it's been really, it's been a really positive experience, I think. It's been really good. I'm going to echo what, what both of you said. I mean, it's funny. We didn't talk beforehand. Um, maybe we <laughs> should have, but we didn't. But, um, which is that, um, and it's funny, I mean, again, I will say this. Um, I've, you know, I have been doing research on housing policy for a long time. And I've worked at the back end of RCTs, so I have, you know, had the privilege of working with APT and Urban Institute and MDRC on sort of, you know, with that sort of advising or getting to do the analysis after they're, you know, they've done the work of the RCTs. I hadn't built one from sort of work to build one from, from the ground up. And I have to say that I've just been blown away by, I mean, and it's what I think Amy said this morning too, it's sort of all of these the incredible number of these sort of consequential sort of logistical details mm -hmm. and decisions. Um, and, uh, and that, um, you know, and it's taken a lot of time, right? I mean, I think we, we, we talk every week, right? Mm -hmm. We talk all the time and uh, we have regular meetings and, and it has been, um, we really have worked to, um, to try to come to consensus and it's been, and it's been complicated by the fact, right? We have two implementing organization. So, um, you know, it's not only you two have to agree. I mean, we want to, you know, and our sample size is, is still pretty big, but it's, you know, small enough that we want to be careful that we sort of have these, um, have, have the two models aligned. And so they're really, um, you know, so we've had a lot of time to talk and sort of learning about each other's perspectives. I mean, the, the survey examples where he knows also that's you know, it was a fantastic example of something, you know, I wouldn't have thought of so much. I'm embarrassed to say now that I wouldn't have thought of. It was these questions about mental health and um, how triggering they, they sort of clearly were now in hindsight. But, um, but I think that, you know, we've had to, we, we also had an issue, right, initially, right, about, um, and Chris, you probably remember this right, I think, um, you know, sort of consensus about payment to the control group members, right? And so this is a classic, issue is that, you know, the, the caseworkers in particular were really concerned about fairness, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, as researchers, we were really concerned about statistical power and just saying, like, well, okay, well, if you give $1,000 to the treatment group and you give $800 to the control group, like, we are not going to find any, we're just not going to have the power. And so that took, I mean, and honestly, I, there was a moment where I thought this is done. We're, we're just not going to. And Chris, you probably remember that, right? And so, so I give, but you know, I think that I really, um, I mean, I think you know, the two of you, the, your your colleagues, are just so incredible, and I've just been so impressed at sort of how you have, 
listened and moved, but also kind of pushed back on, I think we've all had to learn kind of what are the deal breakers? <laughs> what are the things that we just are not gonna let go of? And, and but kind of trusting each other to sort of let go of some of the other mm -hmm. things. And I right. think, so I think it's worked, I, well, I hope. But it's yeah. a funny <laughs> thing because, you know, Amanda, we have this panel, like we, we are just, well, we, we haven't really even started, right? And here we are on this panel talking about what's, you know, what's worked well and what's, yeah. so, so anyway, so far, think big yeah. fingers, fingers, toes crossed. We just sent out the first yeah. info yeah. emails to particip yeah. eligible participants last week. Yeah. So we're, we're so, at the very beginning but, stages. Yeah, but it's, you know, We'll see. I, I'll see the other thing that's been, and this is maybe particular to cash transfers, the other thing that has been, and, and um, Jim Sullivan, I think, has left, but his, he's working on one of our sort of sister studies, um, j Pal, the, the also cash transfer studies in the, in the Bay Area, that, that getting the waivers, the necessary benefits waivers, has been, um, it's taken a long time. It's really taken a long time. I mean, uh, you know, and, and you know, credit to, again your teams. I mean, we we have gotten the major waivers now from the uh, from the state for the CalFresh and CalWorks programs, and but that's obviously been something critical that we couldn't we couldn't run a program where we were basically putting putting um, households at risk of losing critical benefits because they were getting they were getting this money. So fantastic, so many things. I, I, I don't know which question to to ask next, but I think Ingrid, you. you alluded to this a little bit. This is a question for any of you that would like to answer. Um, but kind of, I think, you know, Ingrid mentioned, we're talking about a group of studies on, you know, two hands maybe, but how do, and, but we've all gone through so much learning already, kind of how do we use that to our advantage in the future? You know, Ingrid, you mentioned reaching out to Jim Sullivan, working with Jim Sullivan, working in, with the community of practitioners who are currently going through this process, how do, we, how do we continue to learn from that and use those learnings to not recreate the wheel when we have to do this again? And that may be an unfair question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> um, just what are your thoughts on that and, and how do we move forward from here in a, in a productive way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'll say one thing, a couple things maybe, is that one is that I think really documenting um, I mean, I'm teasing you that you asked us to talk before we've even started. But the truth is, is that it is actually really important for us to sort of all be documenting the details of what we are doing so that, and sort of collecting as much data as we can, sort of, and I don't mean just like administrative data, I just mean like data about the process of implementation so we really can can learn from this and share with with other organizations. Um, you know, hopefully we're going to have a one of those beautiful you know charts at the end <laughs> showing <laughs> the difference. But um, but I think um, but I think that that you know for us now to really be paying paying attention to those details and 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 sharing them out. I think also I think this is where JPAL can be incredibly helpful, and you have been incredibly helpful. I mean, Amanda and Nisha have been our program support folks, and I think connecting us to the or other organizations. We now have a, is it a quarterly call mm -hmm. or something with the other, with the um, other organizations in the, that are, that are working on these studies, and we are sharing notes about, you know, what housing agencies have you contacted to make sure that they will, you know, they will disregard the, the uh, cash transfers as, as income, et cetera. And, and sharing, you know, we've shared our consent form with, with other organizations. So, so I think that that kind of sharing um, is helpful and I think it, it's probably unusual. I mean, the, the fact that, have you, there are five studies now? Four? Four. I think four, four within this group, we probably get to five or six if we yeah. count all of Jim's, Jim Sullivan's studies. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we're, yeah, so that's, I think that's been, uh, that's been very helpful too. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I want to echo the documenting the process. We, my team just wrapped up 
documenting our entire process for over the last two years. So in hopes that we can share that with other organizations and other communities looking to do the same thing and not stumble and you know take all the time that we did to, do, to learn all of these things and navigate it. I think it's like 25 pages long at this point, but it's, it's really like every step of the way, how did we address this? What did we learn? Uh, who did we talk to? I mean, the community, we've, we've talked to so many different providers and just what I've been so impressed with how open everyone is to just like share their knowledge. It's just been amazing. Um, but definitely documenting the process and like this is, I'm hoping to put together a document it's like what I would have loved to receive from somebody. So that's something that we hope to give out uh, to folks who are interested in this uh, once, we're, once we launch. I would also like to recognize all the help that we have already received. Mm -hmm. uh, we reach out to our organizations uh, that are already doing this type of similar projects in the Bay Area, like Abundant Birth Project, and they were extremely helpful in sharing their resources with us. Um, they, they share with us uh, their benefits, frequently asked questions, and um, who they contacted to be able to like train case managers, for example, um, on how to talk about these topics. And I think that if we didn't have that, um, that co point of contact, it would have been so much more uh, complicated to be able to um, even put together a one pager for how are your benefits not going to be affected. Uh, but it's still really important work to be done. So I appreciate all the help, and I think that for future um, like projects, it, it would be extremely important to keep with this collaborative, not just internally, but also relying on other people that have already done um, this type of project. Yeah, great. And then I think one, one final question for me before we shift to, to Q&A for, for Rahina or Chris. Um, Rahina, you mentioned doing these cognitive interviews, and I think something JPL really wants to think about but has a hard time, you know, um, implementing or, or giving really good advice on is, you know, how do we center racial equity? How do we center the experience of the community? How do we bring in the experiences e even of, of your staff and on the ground staff and, and of, of the folks doing the on the ground work? Because, you know, we know that that's not a perspective we see inherently and, and can do that. So Rahina, you mentioned the cognitive interviews, but, you know, what else should we be thinking about it? What are the questions we should be asking and, and what has your experience on this project been like around engaging the community or, or input you've received from your case managers and, and things like that? I think we involved throughout uh, the entire like planning stage a lot, our program directors and even our case managers, and that was super, super important for um, the project, um, especially because there's so many times that we're so focused, even us, in working internally in the data department for power organizations in the final result, right? That we might forget or put on the side uh, the equity like <laughs> factors inside of like this equation. And like the simplest thing, like how many times is it okay to call a family mm -hmm. to reach out to them? Um, we thought like as many as it takes is the best like outcome for our, like it's, it's the best for them, right? Um, but then here, like, our program directors will come in as, like, cultural brokers, which I think is, like, the main thing to bring in. Like, not ma it might not necessarily have to be, cla um, like, the participants. I think it will be amazing to have participants, like, constantly participating in this type of design. Um, but for us, having cultural brokers, like, our program directors was great. Um, and they will tell us, like, Maybe that will be too invasive, and we have to remember that within our programs, something that we really take care of is like bringing dignity back to the families and like working through all these like um, things that maybe uh, in data we don't see as much, right? Um, so let's like limit to certain amounts so that we don't like um, force them into something that maybe they feel uncomfortable with, or even just like. We wanted to bring the research closer to them, so let's, uh, let's go to their homes. And the program directors suggested that maybe that will be too invasive, and of course they will say yes, because it's a type of authority coming into their houses. So uh, just taking these 
things into account. Uh, I'm really appreciative of our program directors. Great. Um, I think questions from the audience. Please. Thank you for this great conversation, for the important work on reducing homelessness, one of our greatest social problems. The next session, the next panel after the break, is going to be on advancing racial equity through randomized evaluations. And so I'd love to set that up by asking about attention to racial inequality in this work, where uh, racism and racial inequality is, uh, plays such a prominent role in the homelessness problem in the United States. Right, that's definitely something that we've kept on the forefront uh, through the development of this project. 80% um, of the families that we serve are uh, headed by single mothers of color. So that, that's like very much ingrained in our day-to-day our -day work. And, and like Rahina said, um, really having those conversations with, with our staff, with our, our participants along the way. Um, it's just like critical, and I think Nikki even said something about it yesterday, about how difficult it is to um, build that buy-in, generate that buy-in, and with with the stakeholders and and the folks on the ground. So definitely, I would say start those conversations early and have them often, and make sure that you're uh, integrating feedback and uh, like an iterative process throughout the the entire process of building it. I mean, the only thing I'd add, just again stating the obvious, that homelessness is a racialized problem, mm -hmm. right? Due to long-term sort of structural racism and discrimination, you have families of color and black families and Hispanic families are much more likely to be, to experience housing stability and to have, um, you know, be, be rent burdened because they're sort of stripped of opportunities for home ownership and, and, um, and but the wealth, wealth disparities, income disparities, have for a whole host of reasons. This, this is a racialized problem. And so I think if we can, if we can sort of make a dent in figuring out um, ways to address the problem of homelessness, I think we will be advancing racial equity. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, please, Bruce. Hey, Bruce from Hong Kong Jockey Club Charities Trust. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, in Hong Kong, um, I visited um, a homelessness operator, and one comment really uh, stuck with me. He said um, what they need wasn't a shelter. Um, they, um, they had a lot of the way he put it, he, they were they had a lot of damage. They were like patients, they're healing. Um, you know, the, it's hard to trust others. Uh, maybe making a friend um, would be even tougher from getting a job for them. Um, so my question for you, I really would love to hear more, is how do you define um, your target of your program? Um, I, I recall the summer program that was talked about earlier. They talked about arrest, arrest rate. Um, uh, so there are like these indicators. Um, for this particular operator, we were trying to see how we can fund them and work with them, but we find it really hard for them to articulate the before and after because it seems that the paths are so varied. So any light you can shed on the target outcomes and even how you address that would be appreciated. I, I think I can answer that question. Yeah. Um, so as an organization, um, we have this tool called the FAM, the Family Assessment Matrix, and it's um, a database where we assess where families are in that moment of time in all those things that you were mentioning, so like mental health, um, social connections, how we're doing with employment, and um, among other things. Because, um, yeah, it's, 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 a, a, it's a thing that is not just like homelessness, right? It, there are so many barriers. Uh, and all of these uh, aspects interfere or might become a barrier towards that. So, sorry for sounding repetitive. Um, so we assess quarterly how families are doing in that moment in time. Um, and it's been really helpful to give us an idea of where should we like put more like emphasis with specific families, not just like as a whole organization, but maybe uh, 
we can do referrals to our behavioral therapy uh, groups or if someone is doing great in other areas and maybe the priority is uh, um, finding a job or a more stable job, uh, we'll send them to our program called SeaWork that helps p families find work. So it's been great to have this tool to be able to assess all of that. Um, and we're hoping with this, um, with this evaluation to be able to um, see how those changes are there, are, are done there as well, at least internally. Yeah, I, I will just say that, I mean, the, the, the main question in the evaluation is whether cash transfers can help to enhance housing stability, and that means sort of reducing the risk of returning to homelessness, you know, staying in an affordable home, not being rent burdened. Um, you know, certainly we are also, um, uh, you know, we actually, and in part actually in conversation with, with our partners, um, I think a lot of the, the program staff in particular felt really strongly that this, they wanted to get a more holistic picture of what the impact is gonna be. And actually we just got funded today from, um, from HUD um, and uh, with some matching from, from Google now to, to do a survey, which I hope will get us to sort of a, a richer picture of sort of the, the other kinds of more downstream, um, um, what we hope will be benefits. But, but there, is, there is evidence suggesting also that just getting into affordable housing, stable permanent housing first actually can really help families then. That can be sort of a launching pad for them to then then succeed in other realms. Thank you. Thank you all. It's really exciting to see all this, all this work happening. Um, in the Bay Area, a big part driver of housing unaffordability is just a lack of housing, right? There just aren't enough houses. So I know you all are thinking holistically about outcomes, which is great, but to the extent you think about a, an outcome like longer-term housing stability, do you worry that there's that just maybe setting you all up for failure in an evaluation where something like rapid rehousing or short-term cash transfers isn't the right program to be having an impact on that given this just lack of available housing? Yeah. Um, well, I, maybe I'll start on that one. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question. Um, you know, I, I don't think that cash transfers are, you know, sort of the only answer to our housing problems, right? That, that um, we do need to build more housing. Right, underlying this, um, I, I think that um, you know, I, I think that in terms of this intervention, in some ways, I was thinking about this in terms of replicability and well, what if we get a null result? Well, you know, it could be that the, I mean, not that I think we're going to get a null result, but let's just say, <laughs> if we were to, that you know, maybe it is just the Bay Area. It's like a thousand dollars a month just isn't enough in the Bay Area. Maybe this would work really well in, um, you know, in Kansas and maybe, um, and so on the one hand, I feel like, you know, we're, we're, we're setting ourselves, self, ourselves up well for generalizability if it works, because then it's like, well, if it can work in the Bay Area, it can work anywhere, right, if mm -hmm. this can, but, um, but you're absolutely right that it is something, you know, something of a risk to, um, to sort of see whether, but, you know, I think we're, we're asking that question and we're, we're yeah, our, like I said, fingers and toes are, are crossed and, you know, and a null result is important too, right? A null result is important too, so. I think there are one, two, and three, and then I think we'll see what happens. Thank you. Hi, Julie Kopel from JPAL. Thanks so much. I wondered as you continue to build the evidence base in this space, because it's, it's, it's small at the moment, what other interventions would you like to try? after this? You know, what, what would you like to, to try next to, to build the evidence base? For us, definitely longer uh, periods of subsidy. So our, our, our outcomes and our data show that the longer that a family is in, in our program and receiving case management support, the more likely they are to sustain housing at exit. So we'd uh, love to try longer term uh, subsidies since I mentioned earlier that ours currently cap out around two years. Um, so we'd love to see something like three years, five years, something like that. Um, that's that's sort of on the, the radar right now. Um, yeah, I think for us, it's a similar answer. Like we'll be really interested in seeing how it works for 
longer period of time. So maybe it's not two years and maybe mm -hmm. it's three years. Like really what will help families become stable and just go. Um, so that I think that will be really interesting. Yeah. I have, I have a long list, sorry. But go <laughs> <No. on. laughs> I'll jump in briefly just to say, I think part of why we're, we're so excited is um, kind of this current set of studies are not all exactly the same, just given that none of the providers are exactly the same. We happen mm -hmm. to get a very serendipitous match here between Compass and Hamilton, but you know, one of the other studies has, you know, I think a little bit more cash over a slightly shorter amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, one of the studies is kind of looking at kind of a, text buddy system, Bruce, to your point of it's difficult for folks to make friends. Um, I, off the top of my head, can't remember the LEO studies, but I think we're very much looking to this current set of studies that's all around the same kind of outcomes and topics and similar but not identical designs to, to help inform that because I don't know that based on the evidence we know exactly what the next step is. And I'm happy to talk later. I mean, I've got lots of, <laughs> well, let me just say one thing, which is that just, um, that I think, uh, that I think there's actually been a fair amount of attention recently to sort of helping people stay in place in their homes. There's just been a lot of, I mean, I'll credit Matt Desmond in part for sort of his brilliant book that sort of got people to pay attention to the issue of eviction. But I feel like we've lost sight at the same time of sort of the difficulty of, um, you know, the many families who, who are in house and sort of what are the barriers to entry and just in terms of screening processes and security deposits and and so I think there are actually some some interesting and I think these are areas where you can. I mean we're partnering with one I see you got me started on these <laughs> RCTs, right? But we're with one organization that is gonna eliminate security deposits. And so what difference, so, so in a sense, that's a little bit of a cash transfer. You can think about it that way, but it also can help to sort of remove that barrier to entry. So are there sort of some, I mean, look, also there are important questions about how to reform our, our larger, like our housing choice voucher program to make it work better. But I, but I think there are some opportunities. And again, as I said, there hasn't been a culture of, of randomization and RCTs and housing, I think partly because it's like, it's so expensive that it's hard to do, but I think there are ways to think about, okay, what are some sort of payment reforms? What are some sort of you know rent payment reforms that we can do that are smaller scale and therefore we can really run a trial? And But they, they really could be consequential. And I think there are two more over here somewhere. Yeah. I'm Hannah Bansell. I work um, with Ethiopia Act. But I have lots of questions around the process of kind of designing the randomization, especially that fairness um, versus research quality piece and communicating with that with staff. My bigger question, though, is around how you communicated that with participants, and especially with something like cash transfer, where people see that very much as one person is getting more of a good than another. How was that communicated in, in the process, and what were the kind of feedback and responses you got from participants? So we have, we're just starting to send uh, the participants the information about the process. And the way that we're going to be doing is um, inviting it into an informational session. And once in the informational session, we'll present it as you'll get the opportunity to get a cash transfer or either $50 or $1,000 and explain that this will be done completely aleatory. Com completely aleatory uh, by NYU, um, Compass and Hamilton won't be the ones reaching out to them, so this will create kind of like a separation for them to not feel that it's us. Um, we We're also, the bad guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we also have internal motives for that because we continue giving services to these clients, so it's really important for us to create a bit of a separation. But we're also putting a lot of emphasis in making sure that um, we're stating um, that this is for the greater good, right? Like, as we've been saying, like, it's hard to say that maybe you won't be getting this, but maybe in the future you could be benefited by this type of cash transfers. So um, just appreciate their participation as well. Right, definitely the, <clears throat> the RCT component was definitely one of the harder sells to, to staff, knowing that, you know, some one group is going to get 
$1,000, the other group isn't going to get that and how that's, that's necessary in order for us this to be uh, an effective uh, research study. So um, just like Rohina said, really looking at the bigger picture of you know, this can be used, this, this evidence can be used to advocate for more support on the road, so maybe not like these families specifically won't benefit from it directly, but you know, families in their situation down the road. Um, and also, we were just talking about this earlier, but really highlighting the fact that nothing's being taken away, everything is additive. So even the families in the control group are still getting the standard services from us. So um, everything is additive. So that, that, that definitely helped too. I think our, our last question. Sure, I don't want to assume that it doesn't work, right, <laughs> or there's a null effect. But in sort of thinking about research and sort of implementation and everything that could go right or wrong, how do you think about, one, the cost effectiveness of this strategy? Because housing and randomized control trials is expensive and scaling it is expensive, so thinking about that. If it doesn't work, what happens to your staff, to the work? If it works, how long or what policy conditions are being set right now, or conversations being set, or if this works, then what? It's a really great question, and, and we're trying to not 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 think about it not working out. Um, but part of um, our work with JPAL, part of our work with the researchers, was was kind of building that internal capacity and sustainability of of our our team, uh, like the data team, and our ability to to run. Uh, research studies like this, so that's we're we're still kind of planning that out, but that's part of it. You know, if if we're not going to do this at a larger scale, or you know, get increased funding specifically for this project, if if you know it's a null result, um, we we kind of have have other things to tackle. Um, but I, like I said, we haven't we haven't <laughs> gotten into that too much because we're we're hoping to really that this is really going to work. And I, I I think the other. Thing, part of why JPAL and, and the other funder, Google.org, was excited about partially doing this all in, in one area is that, you know, of course, nobody's hoping for a, a null effect, but if there are positive effects, we have a group of studies that, that helps show this reproducibility to hopefully push this into the hands of the policymakers or to loop in state or local governments or to be able to push this to the scale where it's not a single philanthropically funded thing so that it can it it brings it to the state of evidence where it's able to scale up. And I, I don't know if this set of studies alone will do it, but it's the start of making that happen, we hope. That's right. Yeah, and we hope, I mean, like you said, we did, I just found out this morning that we got this funding from HUD, but they are really interested. They're really interested in this. As a, so I think, um, and I think that's sort of, you know, if you can, well, we'll see if we get, I mean, hopefully there will be a positive result that we can share with them. But, um, but again, no result would be, would be important mm -hmm. too. Um, and that is the end. Um, it's only fair that I'd be showing the, be shown the, the stop sign that I've been flashing at all the presenters <laughs> <laughs> yesterday and today. Um, but I did promise you a break, and we do have a break until three o'clock, so please grab yourself some more. I'm hoping there's water or coffee or something out there. Um, but we'll be back for the next thing. <laughs>